in Australia today for today's story. I love Australia. I got to visit when I was about 13 with my family. I did not know about the snakes and the spiders then, so I was I actually got to enjoy the visit rather than being traumatized by it. Uh, we're going to start in the small town of Rockhampton, Queensland, which is where the family of Natasha Ryan and her family lived. Natasha had been born in 1984, um, and when she was 14, her brother Chris was only six years old, and her other brother Jason was just a toddler at the time. Uh, she had an older sister also named Donna, but I'm not sure of her age. I think she was about 20. Uh, her parents, Jenny Kerwin and Robin Robert Ryan, divorced, and then Natasha felt you know, overwhelmed and a little bit angry about that. She was depressed. She was acting out. She started to experiment with drugs and a bit of self harming. I'm not sure if I can say that word on YouTube, but anyways, she had gotten herself um, a boyfriend who was quite a bit older than her, 22-year-old Scott Black, who worked as a milkman, which was something I didn't realize they still had in 1998. Uh, Natasha had started skipping school and had run away a couple of times, and the second time in July of 1988, she turned up a couple of days later, contrite, and said she would never do it again. So her mom, Jenny, had actually taken to personally dropping her off outside the school so that she couldn't run away. Uh, and she was, I mean, she, things were started to turn around. Then she was getting a little bit better. She'd stopped sort of crying and carrying on over this Scott character and was going to school, but she was still a brooding teen at that time. And on the morning of August 31st, 1988, Jenny drove Natasha to the front of her school and she gave her mom like a cheery peck on the cheek, said, I love you and got out of the car and went towards the doors of the school. Now, when Natasha didn't come home from school that afternoon, and she still hadn't arrived by the next day, Jenny took the matter to the police. She had actually done that a couple of times before. Um, this time felt a little bit different for her. And because of the other previous runaway attempts that she'd made, the police didn't really take it all that seriously at first and just kind of figured, eh, she ran away, she'll be back in a few days. And that was kind of it. But unlike the last couple of times, she didn't return after a few days or even a few weeks. So Jenny and Robert were starting to fear the worst. And in December of 1988, a 39-year-old woman named Julie Dawn Turner went missing. Julie had worked for a time at an Arbiter's. And on December 28th, 1988, she left Rockhampton's Airport Liberty nightclub in the early morning hours of the morning in a rather intoxicated state. She was apparently broke and she'd been kind of asking around for enough money to get a cab home. Um, and when none of that was forthcoming, she started walking. Uh, and from there, she disappeared. Julie had previously told friends that she was moving in with a guy named Lenny, uh, but she hadn't elaborated any further on that. Only three months later, in March of 1999, 37-year-old Beverly Lego also disappeared. She was last seen at a bank near the East Street Mall. Police started to wonder if Natasha's disappearance might also be connected to these women's disappearances. Um, now, I wish I had been able to get more information on Julie and Beverly's cases, but unfortunately, they were a little bit overshadowed completely by some events that take place after this. Uh, but I did learn that Julie Turner had a daughter named Kylie, um, who now works in youth justice. And all I could find were some sort of vague dates and their names and ages. Uh, police launched an investigation and start to search the area for Natasha. And they managed to track down a witness that says that she was seen that afternoon at a movie theater before getting into a vehicle that had sped off. Uh, they tracked down Scott Black who Natasha had been dating and they search his apartment. They find no traces of her. Now he claims to have not seen her since before she disappeared. Most disturbing is that there have been like no footprints of life from her at all since August 31st, which was when she was reported missing. Her bank account hadn't been touched and there were no further sightings of her after that movie theater. On April 17th, 1999, police were tipped off and led to this rundown Queensland hotel by a wrecking crew who had made this rather horrific discovery. In room 13, the carpet was soggy with blood. There was blood sprayed over the ceilings and the walls. Uh, there were bone fragments in the carpet. In a downstairs freezer, 
Police found a pair of women's shoes that were submerged in this like filthy water. Police believe that the blood belonged to another missing woman named Sylvia Benedetti, who was 19. She had last been seen on a bench talking to a man at the Rockhampton Mall. And the attack had been so savage that the victim, whoever the victim was, had lost about four liters of blood which was about as much as a woman the size of Sylvia would have had in her entire body. Police and residents are convinced by this time that these disappearances are connected and there's a serial killer working their tight little community and really putting people on edge. On the afternoon of April 22nd, 1999, a feisty and music-loving Kyla Steinhardt was on her way home from school. It was, about the, it was only about the second time that she'd been allowed to walk home from school by herself. She had cut through a vacant lot and as a kind of a shortcut. And then while on this matted down trail, she was struck from behind, loaded into the trunk of a man's car. Uh, We know this because eyewitnesses saw her, saw a man load this girl into the car. Um, So they called the police, thankfully. It was a brash and brazen abduction in broad daylight. Now, fortunately, what the eyewitnesses hadn't been able to see because of the tall grass in the field that she was walking in is that after thumping her on the back of the head with and knocking her to the ground, the man had... mm, r-worded her there in the field now based on the description given by the eyewitnesses and a prison guard named ben robson who saw the reports on kira's disappearance and immediately called the police to inform them that they might want to look into a certain man leonard fraser was traced to the vehicle that was seen in the neighborhood where kira disappeared from and they surprised him at his door under the ruse that they're following up on a complaint about a break in his car a break in in his car. Lenny Fraser was a meat cutter at the local slaughterhouse and known by locals as a violent man with an odd way about him. Just to kind of give you an idea of what kind of good old Lenny was, when he was 15, he was sentenced to a year at the Gosford Boys Home for theft. After his release, he assaulted a railway guard and convictions for things like driving without a license, stealing cars, transporting stolen goods would soon follow. In Sydney in 1972, he R-worded a tourist at the Botanical Gardens, a crime that wouldn't he wouldn't be found out about and convicted of for two years afterwards. At 10 o'clock on the morning of July 11th, 1974, so just three weeks after he was released from Long Bay Prison, he approached a young woman as she walked along a road in Sydney and attacked, attacked her from behind using what would become sort of his calling card, um, twisting the woman's up arm up behind her back and then forcing her down an embankment where he r-worded her then under the delusion that the woman had enjoyed him essaying her uh fraser then walked his victim hand in hand back up into the roadway before taking off six days later at 9 p.m on july 17th fraser assaulted a 20 year old woman who was working alone in nearby mount druitt dry cleaning shop. Fraser followed her behind the counter when when she went to look for his dry cleaning and with her hand held up behind her back he was able to r-word her when he was interrupted and then fled when some other customers entered the shop. Three days later at Rudy Hill again in the same proximity Fraser spoke briefly to a woman as she was walking along this kind of quiet road and he punched her in the face and forced her arm again her arm up against her back the woman remained calm and talked to her attacker and convinced him that she was indeed in the mood for some loving and that she would gladly submit um but that she wanted to go back to his house and do it in his bed Uh, so fraser walked the woman again hand in hand back up onto the road as soon as she saw her chance that she broke free and she fled to the nearest house and raised the alarm now fraser wasn't hard to find wasn't hard to find he had left his wallet with his birth certificate in it at the scene of the last attack Uh, it was quickly located and taken into custody in december of 1974 at the sydney district court leonard fraser pleaded guilty to two counts of r word and two counts of attempted r word the court psychiatrist disturbing assessment was that fraser was beyond help quote he has no conscience at all 
Um, he will use anyone and anything to his advantage without giving a lot of thought to other people's feelings. He has little or no impulse control. Apart from this, there's no real psychiatric disability. There is no known treatment for this type of psychopathic state. Um, so with all this in mind, Justice Wooten sent Fraser to prison for the maximum of 22 years and reluctantly set the non-parole per period at what the law said that it was, which was seven years. Uh, quote, but I wish I could make it clear in doing so that I am not in any way suggesting you should be released at the end of that period, um, was what he said. Released in 1981, after serving the minimum seven years, Fraser made his way to McKay in Queensland and took a job as a laborer on the railways. In 1982, Fraser gained entry to a woman's house by showing interest in a car that she had for sale. And then once he got inside, he grabbed her from behind and held her arm up again against her back, as he had done numerous times. Um, and to the amazement of the investigating officers, the woman said that she talked Fraser into allowing her to call her husband while this physical attack was taking place. And then during the call, Fraser took the phone, told the man, I hope you're not going to kill me. I just wanted to prove a point that somebody could break in and our word, your missus. In the McKay District Court, Fraser was sentenced to two months jail for aggravated assault on this particular woman. Now, once out of jail again, uh, Fraser settled in McKay and in late 1982, he met a woman named Pearl and she seemed to kind of settle him down a little bit. Even They even had a daughter together named Missy and managed to hold on to a job as a laborer on the railways for the next two and a half years. In late 1985, after stalking a 21-year-old woman for several days as she went on her daily walks at an isolated beach in Shoal Point, which is north of Mackay, Fraser brutally R-worded her again by pinning her arm behind her back and again in broad daylight. The um, and again, he wasn't very hard to find, so he was sentenced to 12 years in jail. And in sentencing him, Justice Darrington at that point said that he regarded the, the him as a very dangerous man who preyed on women who were strangers and alone. Quote, they would regard you as being the equivalent of a filthy animal. It, meaning the R word, is one of the worst forms of degradation on another human being you can think of, and it deserves no sympathy whatsoever. End quote. In Rockhampton's Etta Creek Prison, which is where Fraser was serving his time, he became known as Lenny the Loon uh, due to his erratic and unpredictable behavior. His He had these violent outbursts. Would, they, they were triggered for like no apparent reason whatsoever. And the prison sort of lure was that it was wise to give Lenny a wide berth. Lenny was forced by the jail management team to serve out every day of his 12 years in the belief that the minute that he was let out, he would reoffend. And he did get out in January of 1997. He moved in with a terminally ill woman in Yapoon, which is a, like a coastal township south of Mackay, after telling her that he was friendless, broke, and had nowhere to live. She was a woman that he had corresponded with and actually visited while he was in prison. And the relationship de developed into a, like a sexual one with Fraser becoming progressively aggressive. And when the woman left the home to go to Brisbane for a treatment for her cancer, he followed her and after she refused to come home with him because she's undergoing cancer treatment, um, he allegedly R-worded her in the hospital chapel. And the woman died six months later of cancer. Fraser returned to live at Mount Morgan in April of 1999, which is a mining town of about 3,500 people on the Burnett Highway southeast of Yapoon and near Rockhampton. He was kicked out when the landlady caught him having relations with her blue healer cattle dog in the backyard. Uh, that's actually a true story. Anyways, when officers knocked on his door that April afternoon, his first words were, I'm not a child. Starts with him. Uh, he didn't initially want to come to the station to talk about his car because he wanted to remain in the neighborhood searching for the little girl that was missing, which was Kira. 
Uh, but he, when he was assured that he wasn't being accused of anything, then he decided to come with them. And although he refused to give up any information about Kira and maintained his innocence about that, after two weeks of interrogations, he broke and confessed to little Kira's abduction, R word and murder, and led them to her body in a heavily wooded area where her body was found propped up against a tree on the bed of a creek, naked from the waist down with her sweater up around her neck and her throat had been cut. Blood evidence was found in the trunk of his car and belonging to Kira. They also made a gruesome discovery of more blood that did not belong to Kira in the trunk of Leonard's car. But the samples did belong to Sylvia Benedetti, Julie Turner, and Beverly Lego. Um, They also found hair in the form of uh, like a severed ponytail from three different women in his apartment one of which the previous owner of that ponytail has never been identified. Uh, But police had no bodies. Uh, His DNA evidence was still kind of in its infancy. So what they really needed was a confession from him. Australia doesn't do Mr. Big stings. They're not admissible there, but they still do undercover stings. And sometimes they use informants. Uh, And so a notorious con man who was kind of looking to amends for his past named Alan Quinn you, he was once featured on Australia's most wanted list, told police that he would be able to con Fraser into a confession. Um, and they took him up on the offer. So Alan befriended Leonard and shared an exercise time in the prison yard with him every day. And as time progressed, Alan was sort of wired to record these conversations. And so for two years, Leonard sat in prison waiting to be tried for the murder of Kira. And they are hoping to also link him to these other murders. Uh, Quinn actually agreed to stay past his own prison sentence so that he could get these confessions um, because he wanted to find the bodies of the people for their families. So Leonard revealed to Alan that he had taken Beverly to Nankin Creek. It was like a popular spot for kids to There was a rope tied there on a tree limb that they could swing and splash into the water from. And once there, he hit her over the head, tied the rope from the tree around her neck, and then pushed her over the water and basically hung her. Uh, Fraser then laughed as he said, quote, you should have seen her kick when they let the rope go. I heard her neck break, and then she stopped kicking and her legs dangled in the water. It didn't take much to kill her because she was really skinny. I took the rope off and dragged her through the water hole. uh, into the long grass where I put her in that ditch. I made sure I pulled the tall grass back up as I went so there'd be no trail left behind in the grass. To make sure she was dead, I placed her sports bra, her black sporting briefs around her neck and pulled them tight so if she woke up, she couldn't breathe and she would die. As for Sylvia, he described killing her as, this is another one I'm not sure if I can say on YouTube, but he says, quote, I bled her like an animal. Um, He said that he met her at the Rockhampton Mall and that she was unhappy with where she was living. She was kind of going through a bad time with her boyfriend. I took Benedetti to a a disused hotel to room 13, told her that I had drugs stored there. I tried to kiss her. She didn't like that. Um, I hit her, knocked her out. I went downstairs to check if anyone had heard her scream. I went back upstairs. She was just lying there staring at me. Um, when, you know, this is what he says is not what I'm saying. When they are unconscious, they always stare at you. I knew it was going to, I knew I was going to be in trouble. So I picked up a block of wood. I thought that it was a block of wood anyways. It could have been a window counterweight. I don't know, but it had serrated edges. He then bragged that he had driven around in his pickup truck with Julie Turner's body in the back covered with a tarp uh, right past a police station. Uh, he said that he had picked Natasha up when she asked him for a ride to the to Yapoon, and he had knocked her out when she fell asleep on his shoulder during the drive. So nine months after confessing to all of these murders, he led detectives to this wooded area, um, like full of deadly snakes and creepy crawlies, just outside of Rockhampton. Um, and there's where they found what was left of Julie's remains, minus her head. Uh, and Beverly Lego in another area and what remained of Sylvia had previously been discovered by surfers near Sandy Point Beach. Her entire remains have actually never been recovered. Uh, He provided maps to where they would find Natasha's body and Robert and Jenny waited on anxious pins and needles. 
uh, for word of her remains being recovered. All of the bodies were found as skeletal remains, um, so they had to be identified one by one, um, but the process of which took weeks. Leonard had said that he had buried Natasha between Rockhampton and the coast behind an abandoned house. He told Alan that he had killed her under a mango tree on the property. Uh, he had bur- buried her using a trench digger. Uh, they dug up that property from stem to stern and they couldn't find anything. They used cadaver, do- cadaver dogs and all of it, but they couldn't find her. Leonard was put on trial for the murder of Kira Steinhardt in August of 2000. He was found guilty, given a life sentence. He offered his, this, this is what his apology was. I'd like to say to her mother and father, and I know a lot of people won't believe me, but you check my background. It's not my go to harm a child. I'm just sorry this is happening. I don't know what made me do it. At least I can try to get help after I get sentenced and all. So that's a good step. End quote. On Natasha's birthday, May 7th, 2001, her family held this makeshift memorial releasing balloons into the sky. Uh, She had missed her sister Donna's wedding um, in which she should have been a bridesmaid. Um, She would have been 17 at that time. Kira's mom, Teresa, became lost. She was unable to deal with the loss. She fled to Melbourne, actually leaving behind her for surviving son and husband living sort of 10 years, the next 10 years in a really deep depression. It wasn't until early 2003 when Leonard Fraser would face prosecution for the other women's murders. And uh, Robert Ryan, who's Natasha's father, took the role of sort of a leader and supporter for the families, making sure that he was there every day to face down his daughter's killer. Then on the 12th day of the trial, Something unusual and unexpected happened. It was during a lunch recess when the prosecutor, Paul Rutledge, got a phone call from the Rockhampton police. And this phone call was basically that Natasha was found and was alive. So what the what? I mean, okay, obviously we're going to get to that part and I'm going to tell you those amazing and unbelievable details, but I just want to finish off this trial of Sylvia, Beverly, and Julia. So obviously Paul Rutledge informed the court that Natasha had been found found alive, um, so he wasn't guilty of her murder. Um, unfortunately, that didn't make the police look too good, but fortunately the jury believed the evidence that he, and so he was convicted uh, of the murder for Sylvia and Beverly and then manslaughter for Julia. Leonard actually yawned and stretched his hands behind his head as the verdicts were being handed down. He was handed three additional indefinite prison terms. On May 28th, 2003, he appeared, of course, which Uh, He appealed, of course, which was denied by Justice Brian Ambrose, who deemed him an untreatable untreatable psychopath. On Boxing Day, or December 26th, as some might call it, in 2006, after serving a total of eight years in prison, uh, he complained of chest pain, was taken to Brisbane's Princess Alexandra's Hospital, uh, where he went into cardiac arrest and quietly passed away in his sleep. Uh, Queensland Premier Peter Beattie said, I don't think there'll be a great deal of sympathy for him. His crimes were horrific. And while no one likes to see someone pass away, I don't think there's going to be a lot of grieving over his passing. I don't think anyone will be shedding any tears. Uh, He was 55 at the time. Okay, so what the heck, Natasha? Where you been, girl? It's on August 31st, 1998. Natasha decided to skip school again. Uh, but she, now she went to the movies. She was picked up by Scott Black. Remember the 22 year old boyfriend and milkman. Uh, Scott took her to his place, which was a 45 minute drive from her home. Uh, that the one that she shared with her mom. Uh, and then she lived there isolated from everyone, never leaving, never speaking to anyone besides Scott and her cat for the next four years. Neighbors never suspected a darn thing. And anytime Scott's family would come to visit, she would hide in their bedroom closet, not making a peep, earning her the later nickname of the girl in the cupboard, which wasn't really accurate. They lived together like a couple, only a couple where one of them could leave the house and the other one couldn't. Um, So while she stayed at home with the curtains drawn, she spent her days watching TV videos, working out in her home gym. She learned what she should have learned in school by watching um, by the, using the internet and then taught herself how to sew, she, sew so she could have new clothes. Her only outings were a couple of trips to the beach in the dark of night. And in 2003, they actually moved together back to rock camp and, and settled only five minutes from her mom's place. Um, when she saw on the news that Leonard Fraser was being sort of 
McBride for her murder. Uh, she called a, the kid's help phone and told them you know, where she was and that she was safe. Now, whoever took that call considered it truthful and actually wrote an anonymous note to the Rockhampton police and then provided them with the number of that the call had originated from. And the police came and retrieved a rather shaking and pale, terrified Natasha from her closet. Now, her reasons, as she said that she felt angry and everything, she said, quote, I didn't want to be at school. I didn't want to be at home. I didn't want to be there in that life. And if Natasha wasn't already at the time the most hated woman in Australia, she decided that she was going to tell her story, but only to reporters that paid her, which I believe was 60 Minutes Australia, which paid her $100,000 for that. In 2005, Rockhampton District Court Judge Grant Brighton sentenced Scott to three years in jail, which was suspended after 12 months for perjury after he had pled guilty to telling investigator investigating police officers that he didn't know where she was. In 2006, Natasha Ryan was found guilty herself of causing a false police investigation and was fined $1,000 by magistrate Annette Hennessy, but she ruled that Natasha did not have the means to pay the costs of the investigation. So in the same court proceedings, Scott Black was further punished by being fined $3,000 and then being ordered to pay $16,000 towards the fine um, the fine for the investigation costs. In 2008, when Natasha was 24 and Scott was 31, the couple married in Byfield's Ferns Hideaway in front of 35 guests. They reportedly sold their exclusive wedding photos to Women's Day for $20,000. $200,000. Uh, her mother had forgiven her by then and said the wedding gives Natasha the opportunity to start fresh. According to the Courier Mail, after the wedding, she changed her name to Tash. Uh, they have three children together. No reports on if they're still married today or not. In 2011, they appeared in court due to an incident in which the couple were heard arguing at their home, um, sort of about moving their vehicle out of the garage. And upon the police being called, Scott Black refused to give a breath test. Black's defense lawyer argued that he had been drinking heavily and his judgment had been affected, telling the court his client was frustrated because he had only recently lost his job as a delivery driver and had his license rescinded. But wait, there's more victims in this case. Natasha's brother Jason was only six when Natasha reappeared in his life. And so coupled with his parents' divorce, um, uh, which he did get, which I don't think he got any counseling for. And he says that he was depressed and hated himself, which is no excuse for the fact that he choked his girlfriend, pushed her off a sofa, cut her with the keys and beat her, and then turned to his own child and covered his mouth and nose so hard that he popped his eardrum. Uh, so he was convicted of battery in 2011. But to me, that's just an absolutely crazy story. Now, I didn't have the time or the energy to really get into it, but Missy Rigby, who is Leonard Fraser's daughter, uh, she was interviewed. She gave a really detailed write-up in an exclusive called My Dad's a Serial Killer. So I'm going to put the link in the show notes for you on that one. Um, and then also in a little bit of defense of Natasha, I guess, in a later interview about a year after her reappearance, she was quoted as saying that she knows why she did it um, and that she didn't feel that there was any point in trying to tell anybody else, trying to explain herself, basically, that she's taken that to her grave with her. Uh, in the 48 Hours report that was done in 2017, Robert Ryan, her dad, revealed that he had lost contact with Natasha again and that he'd only kind of heard that she'd had a baby through the news, uh, but hadn't seen her or never met the baby. So it sounds suspiciously like there was something kind of something about her relationship with her dad that caused her some distress that, uh, I mean, I'm not going to throw any accusations out there. So who knows why she really did it? I think, I think only she knows. So it turns out there's an update on this case, which is why you're seeing me without any makeup on or anything like that, because I had to tell you this. So on June 3rd of 2024, so literally like not that long ago, a couple of, well, at the time I'm recording this, it's only like a couple of days ago, but it's like a little while ago for you. Um, Natasha Ryan. Um, so the bot, I'm just going to read this. This is actually from the daily mail. The body of Miss Ryan, now known as Tash Black, was found on Rock Captain Golf Course by police on Sunday after her husband reported her missing. Um, it is understood that she earlier left her home on foot in the direction of the golf course, uh, sparking her husband husband's call for help. Her death is not being treated as suspicious, and a uh, report is being prepared for the coroner. 
Uh, but she died without ever revealing the reason behind why she first hid in the head first hit the headlines 26 years ago when she suddenly vanished at age 14. Um, she was discovered almost five years later hiding in the cupboard. We own, we know all that stuff. So it sounds like she might have um, unalived herself, but we don't know until the coroner's report comes out. So I'll let you know. Anyways, I'm going to be back again next week with another case. I'm sorry that this was a rather long one. As always, thank you for watching.